Welcome to Ask Raw TV. I am here today with Dr. Michael Wall, Doctor of Nutrition and Director of Nutritional Services at Integrated Medicine of Mount Kisco, PC. Our topic today is Lyme disease. What is Lyme disease and what are the main symptoms of it? Well, Lyme disease is a very important condition to be aware of, and it uh, commonly goes unnoticed by most physicians unless they are really attentive to it. In short, Lyme disease is a tick-borne infection, and there are many different types of tick-borne infections. There's Lyme disease, there's proliquiosis, there's babesiosis, but uh, Lyme disease is the most prevalent one that uh, most people seem to be aware of. So that disease... Uh, that is, Lyme disease is uh, carried on a tick, and that uh, tiny little tick can make its way onto your skin and would have to be attached to your body for at least 24 hours, it's thought, for it to transmit uh, Lyme disease into the person. The symptoms of Lyme disease uh, are usually uh, profound fatigue and muscle aches and pains that come on very suddenly. The person may or may not have a rash that's visible on the skin or multiple rashes known as bullseye rashes, which are basically large red oval rashes with a, a center where the, the tick would, would bite with a slightly uh, lightened um, center around where the tick bit and then a redness around that area. However, most of the time, a person never notices bullseye rashes they may never happen at all, and they're just left with these unexplained symptoms. What are the challenges of diagnosing Lyme disease, and what implications do these difficulties have on the patient? Well, this is a huge problem, uh, and I've seen this in my practice, particularly since we're in a part of the area of the country where Lyme disease is prevalent. So the first thing is, if you are in an area of the country or in your locality where there is Lyme disease known, then it should come up in the diagnostic considerations by the healthcare provider. If you're not in an area where it's, uh, it's thought to occur, then it probably is much rarer of an occurrence, but should always be considered because these conditions can show up in odd places. The challenges of diagnosis is that the testing for Lyme disease is not all that great, but there are two basic types of tests for Lyme disease. There's what's known as an ELISA test, which is a blood test, and a Western blot test, which is another blood test. Most healthcare providers, when they check a person for Lyme disease, will do so if they have a high clinical suspicion the person has these symptoms, they're in an area where there's known to be Lyme disease, and they'll check the blood work, and they'll do the ELISA test first. If the ELISA test shows that there's no Lyme disease, that's usually the end of the story. Unless that practitioner is, is convinced that this person's symptoms really reflects Lyme disease. So the definition of Lyme disease by the Center of Disease Control does not include that a person has to have positive Lyme disease testing. A practitioner can treat the person with antibiotics for Lyme disease if he or she thinks that it's Lyme disease. Now back to testing. I mentioned this ELISA test. And if that's negative, then a doctor does not go further usually with the other test called the Western blot test. But I can tell you, in my opinion, that is a mistake. I have found many people that have negative ELISA blood tests for Lyme disease that have positive Western blot tests. For those of you that are familiar with that, the Western blot test is also known as checking the bands. The Center of Disease Control, which originally came out with the diagnosis of Lyme disease guidelines, never said that a person has to have a certain number of bands to be diagnosed with Lyme disease. They clearly say that it's up to the suspicions of the practitioner to treat a person for Lyme disease, and, the, and if the testing happens to be positive, then that kind of clinches the diagnosis. But to be fair, the Western blood test, according to the CDC, is considered positive if the person has five or more IgG bands or two or more IgM bands. But that does not mean that if a person has fewer IgG bands or fewer or no IgM bands or IgG bands that they don't have Lyme disease. So at the end of the day, if the practitioner or the patient strongly feels they have Lyme disease, then usually a course of doxycycline is given for either 21 days or usually a month and sometimes longer 
If the person responds, it's usually Lyme disease. Now, contrary to popular belief, most people do recover from Lyme disease if they're treated early in the disease, but they may not, and they may develop what's known as post-Lyme syndrome, which may mean one of at least two things. The person still has Lyme disease, and they did not respond to antibiotics, and they need a different antibiotic, or they did respond to the antibiotic, and the Lyme disease is no longer present in the body, but unfortunately, the Lyme disease infection that they did have caused problems with inflammation and the immune system. So the person is suffering from a bunch of symptoms. Many of these people believe they still have a Lyme disease tick. There's a lot of controversy in this area. And in our practice, it doesn't matter so much. If there's some doubt as to whether or not someone has a Lyme disease infection still, or they're just suffering from the aftermath of the infection, if they respond to antibiotics, then great, give them them. But antibiotics, particularly for the long term, are very dangerous and very serious secondary and horrific infections can develop in a person taking antibiotics for long periods of time. One of the infections is known as C. diff infection, which can kill a person. Nutrition does certainly play a role in Lyme disease. Um, the use of the nutrients that help reduce inflammation, which include antioxidants and a clean low sugar, low refined and processed diet, a diet high in fish oils or other omega-3 sources are very strongly anti-inflammatory and also vitamin D. Vitamin D supplementation reduces long-term effects of Lyme disease and those that are treated with antibiotics. So this is a very complex, a very important topic, but I've just given you the basis, uh, basics of, of testing. What are the advantages and limitations of using an intra, intravenous nutrition protocol for the treatment of Lyme disease? Well, uh, in our practice, we use lots of intravenous nutrition, so uh, we have seen huge benefits. Um, disadvantages are that intravenous nutrition is almost never covered by insurance, but is usually very well tolerated in individuals. So using nutrition in the form of intravenous nutrition one must understand, provides a level of nutrition that one couldn't necessarily eat and nutritional supplements couldn't necessarily uh, achieve. So if one wants very profound healing and to allow healing to take place that otherwise might not happen through just diet and nutritional supplements, intravenous and intramuscular forms of nutrition should at least be considered. This has been Dr. Michael Wall, 